All right, so describe the importance of the Potsdam Conference. How is this last meeting between the big three different than the meetings before? How are tensions rising between the USSR and the United States? There you go. Bless you. All right, so we talked about three meetings now. All right, I didn't get to mention too much about the Potsdam Conference yesterday. But what were the other two meetings? What was the first meeting between the big three? Connor. Yeah, the Tron Conference. Good job. And what was the goal? What was the objective of that conference? Paul. Open up the third one. Yeah, good job, right? So to start this front here to try to break the Atlantic Wall that Germany had solidified in northern France. So setting up for the what invasion? What? Yeah, good job. So the Normandy invasion, the D-Day invasion. Good. All right, so that was the first meeting. Okay, Stalin's pleading out to the Allied powers to the West, saying that we need a little bit more effort in the Western Front. And, uh, well, that's what we do so, right? And we start this third front, technically, right here. Okay, good, good. 
All right, so that first meeting was with Stalin, Churchill, and who? Who was that president of the United States? Who was it? Parker? No. Connor? FDR. Yeah, FDR, good yeah. job. So Eisenhower would be appointed to lead the, the uh, commands on the D Day invasion. So FDR, good. All right, so that's the Toronto Conference. That happened right before the D Day invasion, obviously. All right, then. Move past it, right? We're getting closer to the end of the war in Europe. So the Battle of Berlin is about to happen, right? So the Western powers are pushing from the West, right? United States, Great Britain, and I guess you can say France at this point. Then you have Stalin, right? And the Soviet Union moving from the East. They're closing in on Berlin. What was that next conference? What was that second conference? Chris, the Yola Conference. Yeah, good job. And this is FDR's last meeting, right? So with FDR and Stalin here, they have negotiations, which Kind of sways in the direction for Stalin. Right? Things start to look a little bit more better for his behalf. All right, so what were they talking about here? <laughs> what did Stalin get? Where it looked like, oh, gee, we're just getting a lot here. Parker? All right, yeah, so Germany and Berlin, right? So you got to think too, Berlin's over the eastern side of Germany. So you got to think too, when it comes to supporting these people in Berlin and the western side of the capital, it's going to be tough. And it's going to lead to us just airlifting supplies and materials into it, which you'll learn later down the road. All right, so Germany split right down the middle. Anything east of that, right? Anything east of that is belonging to the Soviets, except technically for Berlin, right? Berlin split in half, right? Half of it to the Soviets, half of it to the Western powers. All right, but every every uh, state here, every country, and right, there be you know that Soviet satellite states here, it is going to belong to the Soviet Union. And like I was mentioning in today's world here with this war with Russia Ukraine, is where Putin says this is rightfully Russia's. So ever since 1945, the Soviet Union, right, had control of it. And then at the end of the Cold War, while these countries start to appear, some of them joining, a lot of them joining NATO, which they view as this invasion closer to this border. But ever since 1945 here, Stalin was pleading to have control of these Eastern European countries. And why? What was the reason? Why do you want to control these countries here? So obviously it pushed Germany back, right? They marched right through these lands and pushed Germany back to Berlin. But why else? Why else? Oh, All right, spread communism. That's another reason. Good job. So wherever the Soviet Union goes, communism falls. Good. Connor? Resources. Resources. All right. Good. Good. Why else? So think about it. Since the Napoleonic Wars, what was going on? What happened with Russia? Got they got invaded, right? So with Napoleon and France, they invaded deep into Russia. World War I, Germany invades far into Russia. And World War II, they were very close to taking Russia and the Soviet Union. So in other words, they want to protect, uh, protect themselves. They want a buffer zone in between the West and the Soviet Union. All right, so Stalin wants these lands protected. What? I thought we mentioned that as one of the Okay, so with that, okay, you can see how Stalin wants to use that as protection, right? You can't blame them. How many people they lose World War II? I get to show the slides. How many people? Civilians and soldiers. Connor, those are the exact ones, but I know they have most casualties. Yeah, by far, right, Chris? Yeah, 27, 27 million people. So he's saying, hey, all right, throw us a bone here. So FDR says, yeah, we'll do that. We'll give you the land. Yeah, we really can't argue against it without you. Who knows how long this war would have lasted? Who knows? Maybe Germany would have got their hands on a nuclear weapon if it would have prolonged a little bit longer. Who knows? So with the Soviet Union, they're granted this land. And a lot of people look at FDR and say, wow, you're too easy on the Stalin. You just allow him to control and capture these lands and spread communism all throughout Europe, which, again, you can't really argue with their fighting. Right? They fought Germany and Eastern Front ever since 1941. That many casualties, one you gotta get it. All right, okay. So, what did Roosevelt get in return? What did he get in return at the Golan Conference? He used to say he got somewhat of an agreement with Stalin. What was it, Connor? Stalin agreed to help fight Japan. Yeah, good job, right? So, after Germany was defeated, after the, the uh, Battle of Berlin, they said, We'll help you out in the Pacific Theater against Japan. And FDR was like, Great, it's good. We'll just, you know, obviously uh, seize these conversations and pick up another time. Right, we know that FDR dies, right? Okay, so he passes away even before World War II in Europe's even over, right? So he passes away, new president of the United States. What's his name? Paul Truman. Yeah, 
Matthew Jackson Truman comes in charge, and now we're here at the Potsdam Conference. So this happens right after the Trinity test, this meeting between the big three. So in Potsdam, Germany here, they meet and they talk about what's going to happen right here with Japan. Right? So the Soviet Union is still aiming to help the United States out in the Pacific theater. So again, wherever they go, what falls with? Communist, right? So with that, we already see that this is the new danger, the new threat. And we need to try to prevent this from spreading as far as possible, as much as possible, right? And we want to try to contain communism. Okay, all of Eastern Europe is contained, right? Communism is there, right? We need to try to prevent it from spreading down to Asia, which we know China becomes a communist country. We know North Korea, right? Obviously, Vietnam then becomes communism. All right, so the goal is to try to prevent it to spread to Japan. All right, so Truman has a different encounter with Saul. He's a little bit harder on him. He says, hey, we gave you a lot of this land here, right, in Eastern Europe, Okay, we want to try to, you know, really have negotiations, negotiation sway more for the Western powers. And what does he use as a trump card, as leverage? What does he say we have? Again, Parker? Two. Yeah, we have two nuclear weapons, right? If things don't start going on our behalf, then we're going to utilize these weapons. Okay, Saul believes no, he didn't, right? He says, ah, we don't believe it here. Okay, they're setting up for this invasion over in Asia to try to continue to spread communism and defeat Japan to help us out. But at the same time, they're already looking to spread their dominance, spread their sphere of influence. So we use the atomic weapons, and it shows that we're not bluffing. But tensions are rising more and more. Okay, now that we have this nuclear weapon, what does the Soviets want to create? A nuclear weapon. And it's going to create an arms race between the two powers. That lasts for a long, long time through the Cold War. Right? Obviously, the space race is going to come around too. So, already, even before World War II is over, even in Europe, right, then over in the Pacific, obviously, these tensions are rising higher and higher and higher. All right, is there any questions? So, you can see how the Cold War is already beginning, and these tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union are already beginning, and this fear of communism spreading. Well, that's always on the mind of the United States. All right, so I'm going to put up these terms again just to make sure you have them. I know we didn't really get to go over them too much in detail, but I want to finish up talking about the Nuremberg trials and the Tokyo war crime trials. All right, so how this war comes to a close and how some of these military officials here are going to you know, face the uh, repercussions of these crimes that they placed all throughout the world. And obviously in Japan, over in Europe with Germany. So things are going to be looking for justification. All right. So I'll give you like a minute or so. Write these down. If you guys didn't get to finish them up. I know I got cut short. But...
All right. Okay. So I know I had this as a term, uh, but shortly after Pearl Harbor, well, the United States wanted to try to protect itself from internal strikes, any type of rebellion that could happen on American soil. Again, with Pearl Harbor, you got to imagine this is one of the first attacks ever right our country's seen on American soil. I know at the time it was the territories, mostly that used as a military base, but still, right, close to 3,000, 2,500 uh, Americans were killed in this event. So to try to prevent an internal attack, FDR thought it was the best interest to create these internment camps for Japanese Americans. So Japanese Americans were placed in these internment camps. And well, you gotta imagine, they're ripped from their homes. They are obviously lost their jobs. They lost their way of life. And they were sent to these remote locations all throughout right, the country, more specifically in the desert area, right? So Southwest United States, where these camps were created. Right, they look a lot like concentration camps. They do. Right, the living was not the greatest. Right, when it came to water, when it came to food, it was very low. And you got to imagine there they are, caged, right, in this remote location in the United States. So for the Japanese Americans, they faced a lot of hardships. Okay, and uh, shortly after, before these camps were created, many of these people were brutalized, killed, lynched, right, in these cities all throughout, especially in the western part of the country. Because Japan is the new enemy, right? In World War One, we talked about some of the um, some of the acts that were created, the Sedition Espionage Acts, how many German Americans were mistreated. But now this time around, obviously Germany still the the enemy. But at the same time, Japan now with these Japanese Americans on the western side of the country, more on focus, right? Yeah, they're losing everything. So these people suffer, right? They faced a lot of hardships. Okay, I'm not going to say it was the extreme when it comes to these concentration camps that we're going to talk about, the Holocaust, but the living was not the greatest at all. Right? Again, these people lost everything. They lost a lot, right? And uh, when it comes to their livelihood, well, they faced a lot of mistreatment. All right, so this is a dark stain in American history, obviously. And again, this happened right after Pearl Harbor. This continues out through the majority of the war. And you got to think, after the war, well, what do you go back to? You don't have your home. You don't have your land, right? You don't have a, you don't have a job. And again, you're going to be mistreated pretty much by a lot of the populations, communities around the country. So these were terrible, terrible acts, right, on the Japanese Americans. So for FDR, right, a lot of people look at this and say, wow, this is really, really, really bad. So much so in the 1980s, under President Reagan, he puts out an act to try to help with compensation reparations, form of money sent to Japanese Americans. Again, that's a long time after World War II. And uh, many of these people were probably long gone. But in any case, this was our way of saying sorry, even though it's not much of an apology. But anyway, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned it, talked about it, with these Japanese internment camps. All right, so World War II deaths, okay? So these statistics really hit home, I think, when it comes to the military deaths you can see in red, right? Civilian deaths, right? So when you look at the Allied powers especially, well, they were really hit hard with civilian deaths. Right? I'm not going to say the Axis powers weren't either, okay? Obviously, this was a world war, a global conflict the world's never seen before. Yeah, World War I was pretty bad, but when you just look at the numbers, well, World War II tops it for sure. All right, so with the Soviet Union especially, okay, I know it's hovering right before 24 million, but it's estimated more than that, obviously, when it comes to just the sheer numbers, okay, the losses. Uh, the United States, you can see, pretty small, right? 500,000, roughly around, okay? And uh, yeah, that was a, that's a large number, but at the same time, comparable to the Soviet Union, to China, to many of these other countries, like even Germany, right? It's really not too much. And uh, we pride ourselves, even still this day, uh, when it comes to our operations, even though some of these names are pretty wild. What did you say? They come up with the letters of it first? Yeah, the Pentagon comes up with we'll give two letters. And then you have to come up with a name. Yeah, it's like either a two-syllable two word or like a two-word, like a clip. Okay. That's so like, we'll give them like... Peace. All right, we're good. Okay, yeah. So with these operations here, all right, they plan to try to obviously eliminate the number of casualties. When it comes to prisoners of war, we try to make sure we can get every man back. So that's why our numbers are so small compared to other countries. Our training, our uh, experience too, now more than ever, obviously World War II is a little bit different. We weren't prepared, so to speak, right away like these other countries. But now, again, 
when it comes to our military funding, well, we want to make sure that we can get and eliminate as many casualties and you know, make sure we don't have as many military deaths as possible. Russia still this day with the Russia-Ukraine war, you can see it with the numbers. Well, they're just more try to shock and awe, just send as many troops in as possible. And even if they're not experienced, so be it, right? Throw them into the front lines, try to overwhelm the the, uh, the enemy here. Right? Obviously, in Stalingrad, that occurred in World War II and many wars after. Okay, again, the United States is a little bit different when it comes to trying to protect our soldiers and with our plans or operations, they're very detailed. Right, so showing the minimal amount of deaths and casualties. All right, so last thing I want to mention here with the Potsdam Conference, we talked about this last meeting between the big three, and we mentioned about how this is already shaping up for the Cold War. Right, FDR, a lot of people look at it and say, wow, he was a little too friendly with Stalin. He just allowed for all of Eastern Europe to be consumed with communism, which, yeah, it's true, but again, you can barely deny, you can't deny what the Soviets did in World War II. Without them, who knows how the war will end. And obviously now and over in Asia. So Truman realized, well, we want to try to save American casualties. We don't want to try to set this invasion, Operation Downfall, on the mainland of Japan. It would be brutal to try to overtake this. So again, using the atomic weapons, which you guys read about on Friday, we reviewed it yesterday. That was probably the best decision. Again, it's your opinion. It's your, under, you know, your understanding of the event, what we may have done. But they're estimating close to 10 million people dying if this invasion took place. And at the same time, we prevented communism from spreading more in Asia. If that would spread to Japan, who knows what these wars would have looked like. The Korean War, pretty tough, right? Especially five years after World War II. The Vietnam War, a decade after that. right? If there was a war on the mainland of Japan to try to stop communism from spreading, it probably would have been pretty up. All right, so with the war crimes. Well, why Nuremberg? Why did they try to have these trials here in Nuremberg for Germany? We'll focus there first, then we'll go to the Tokyo war crimes. But why Nuremberg? Go ahead, Connor. Mike, are you sure about the of some of these Nuremberg laws? Yes, good job. You guys remember talking about the Nuremberg laws? We will mention more tomorrow as we're going to focus on the Holocaust a little bit more in detail. And obviously, they have to answer the crimes, a lot of these Nazi officials, for the Holocaust and these crimes against humanity. Not the card game, okay, but actual crimes against humanity. All right, so with the Nuremberg trials here, they wanted to have it in Nuremberg, well, because, well, this city wasn't nearly as destroyed as many of the other cities in Germany. Also, yeah, this is the start, sort of, you know, so to speak, of the Nazi regime. A lot of these rallies, a lot of this inspiration of the Nazi ideology was happening in Nuremberg. Whenever you watch any different types of propaganda videos of, well, Nazi ideology, Goose Teppen, you know, it's just crazy with Hitler. Uh, a lot of that occurred in Germany, uh, in Nuremberg, Germany. So why not start it, right? Why, why not end it where it started, okay? So that's why they have in Nuremberg, Germany, okay? So with that, they want to try to show and display to the world that these people, these Nazi officials, will answer the crimes that they dealt all throughout Europe during World War II and afterwards with the Holocaust, during, you know, even before World War II with the Holocaust, so these Nazi officials had to present, while well, they were presented with the war crimes. So the war crimes were presented to this tribunal, which the judicial system was set up with the Allied powers, the Soviet Union, the United States, France, and Great Britain. So they each had a set of their judicial, you know, I guess you say judges there, to uh, deem what was right, what was wrong, and present this information to the public. And yeah, it was broadcast all around the world. So, again, you got to think, too, these judicial systems, especially in the Soviet Union and the United States, Great Britain, France, they're probably all different. But when it comes to these crimes, they definitely focused together on them. They all have somewhat of a similar agreement that these people need to be trialed. And obviously, a lot of them were killed. All right. So with that, they were presented the crimes and they even allowed them to discuss the material and discuss what was what was going through their minds at the time. Again, a lot of propaganda, right? The media controlling the populations, but at the same time, right, with the concentration camps that were displayed and showed and the horrific sights of it, the terrible sights of it, well, it was one of those things where they really didn't have a leg to stand on. Right? A lot of these Nazi officials were trialed and put to death by hanging, right? And this lasted from 1946 to 1949. So this was a pretty long span as they were trialing a lot of people. And again, we just didn't go in and kill these Nazi officials because that's not the order we want to present. 
That's not the world order that we want to show from here on out. We want to make sure that there is a trial by jury. We want to make sure that moving forward, we can do things the right way. Because after World War I, did we do things the right way? No. Treaty of Versailles kind of failed, obviously. The big blunder. Start of World War II. So we want to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Again, yeah, the Cold War starts after World War II, but in all reality, it's a little bit better of a way to go about it than at the end of World War I. Right, one thing to note with Hermann Goring, okay, he's the guy in the bottom picture. He does commit suicide before the before he was going to be uh, put to death. So he uh, ingests a cyanide capsule and dies before he could be. Um... All right, so with that in Nuremberg, again, we want to try to project something moving forward that the international level can come together. These countries around the world can come together and focus on these crimes against humanity, mm -hmm. right? and uh, crimes of war crimes and uh, solve them together. And finally, same thing, the Tokyo war crime trials, it was kind of mimicking what was going on in Nuremberg, right? We wanted to try to do the same thing here with these Japanese officials. Hideki Tojo, right? He would be presented as one of the main uh, figures here with these Tokyo war crimes. And if you guys get a chance, well, when they're reading through a lot of the horrors that he presented through China, through his time as uh, this military dictator, right? it, it's kind of funny. There's a guy sitting behind him, and as it's being presented, what he was doing, all the crimes that he committed, there's a guy that slaps him in the back of the head. Like, as it's being read, he's like, what the heck is going on? So it kind of gives a little bit of a chuckle in the crowd. But anyway, uh, with that, a lot of these Japanese officials, too, were killed, right? And trial first, obviously. Again, we want to try to create a new world order, right, so to speak, with the Allied powers, making sure we're all on the same page. Even though the Soviet Union and the United States are not seeing eye to eye, we can come together and trial these, these figures, these members okay, of Japan and Germany. All right, is there any questions? What about Italy, Mussolini? What happened to that guy? You guys remember? We talked a little, we talked a little bit about it. Why? He was killed like halfway through the invasion. People. Yeah, yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. So with Mussolini, we talked about him at the start of the chapter, and yeah, him and his wife were drugged through the streets, strung up by their feet, and their bodies were mutilated. So for Hitler, maybe that's one of the reasons why he committed suicide, so his body wouldn't be mutilated quite like Mussolini. So with these dictators, these extreme authorities here in these countries, well, they're all being very well their trial and put to death all right is there any questions all right so i with the holocaust i want to focus more after the war okay and get in more detail about it and those are going to archery trip okay make sure you guys watch the video lessons and there is an assignment about sources for the holocaust you'll read through some of these articles and there's a few pictures and propaganda pieces that i'd like you to look at the start of it, Crystal Knock, Nuremberg Laws. We already mentioned about it. We talked a little bit about it already. So that's kind of a review. But we will talk more in detail about concentration camps. All right. So that's all I got here. Actually, watch a video. That'd be good. The Nuremberg Trials.